Welcome to the Character Chronicles, the People Show. Checking the polls. Fusker Nation brought to you by DPS Concrete Construction. Check them out at dpsconstruction.net. Also, characterchronicles.com as well. Ladies and gentlemen, will Nebraska bounce back? That is the question. I'm not just talking about beating Purdue, by the way. Okay. We are going to talk about Purdue briefly. I'm going to give my keys and prediction to that, but not only that game, but going forward as well. Will Nebraska bounce back? Now, let's just start one game at a time. If you believe Nebraska is going to beat Purdue, then smash that like button. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you missed our last show from Sunday, I talked about this may be the wake-up call that Nebraska needs, the Illinois game. Maybe the wake-up call Nebraska needs. All right, and the double interview with the number one recruit in the state of Nebraska, Mr. Christian Jones, and a current Nebraska player. We're working out who it's going to be, whether it's Dante Dowdell or Isaiah Nayor, Heinrich Harburg, whoever it might be. We're working that out, working around their schedules. That's going to go up on Thursday now. Okay, but make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the stuff we're doing here on the Character Chronicles. Now, I do want to let you find folks know, and I pay attention to what the people have to say. All right, I read messages, whether you send them to me at characterchronicles.com, the website, whether it's on so my social media accounts, which is Facebook. Yes, I'm on TikTok now. X, whether it's my brought back from the dead like Lazarus Instagram account. Okay, and of course, YouTube, also on Apple and Spotify as well. I do read the messages you find folks send me. So here are some of the ones that kind of stood out to me after the Illinois game, heading into the Purdue game, and the rest of the season going forward for Nebraska. All right, and my beautiful bride, Angie, is going to put these up on the screen as well. All right, the first one, you don't find out who you are when times are good. It's in trials and tribulations and how we handle them that defines us. Nebraska lost a totally winnable game. How will the team respond? And then they appreciated my last video. Another one says, this team reminds me of the early Osborne teams. They haven't learned the killer instinct when they get the lead and seem satisfied to sit on a lead and the coaches lack the ability or the smarts to make adjustments at halftime. By the way, this is what they're saying. Okay, to be clear. I would like to see more adjustments throughout the game, in fairness. Now, I hope this is the kick in the pants for the whole program to wake up and realize the level of effort that is needed throughout the whole game of four quarters, baby. That said, this has been refreshing after last year's debacle. All right, ask Skurs News on Twitter. Give them a follow. Rule said during his presser, they need to go back and reevaluate what they're doing on defense. Do you believe it can be fixed at this point in the season with the personnel we have? That was what he asked the fans on X or on Twitter, whatever the thing is called now. And uh, he talked about, obviously, we can't switch midseason from a 3-5 to a 4-3, so what can be done to improve this defense? Okay, I don't think they're going to switch schemes, by the way. Now, what he talked about in his X tweet, Twitter post, thingamajiggy, uh, improved tackling. I think too much time and energy was given during the offseason to get takeaways. We forgot how to fundamentally tackle. It's a fine line. It's a fine line between working on tackling and working on takeaways. It's a fine line in a game between trying to make the tackle and trying to make the strip tackle or the strip sack. The best way to do it, the first man in, okay, tackle. The next man in, strips, once you've got the tackle secured, by the way. Then he mentioned be more aggressive. Last year, we were blitzing guys from all over the place. This year, we were trying to get home with three and four guys. It's not working. What else? That's what he asked. Give him a follow on X. Now, I will say this. We were getting getting home with three or four guys and I was loving it. You got to be able to adjust. If you're not getting home with three or four guys, then you got to bring extra guys. You got to make those adjustments. All right. The BA coaches show at the BA coaches show on X. He said, rewatching this game. Now I can't lie. Our defense looked atrocious. This was his take. I believe they can turn it around, but the defensive back play was extremely poor. I have to call it like I see it now. Red, white corn sports responded to that and said one theory is last year Tony White's defense was new and different. Now the Big Ten had all year to study it and exploited it. If that's true, we need to either disguise our coverages better and not show what we have shown in the past. As a coach, how feasible is this to do during the season? So that's a fair point. I think back to the read option days with Colin Kaepernick before the whole knee thing and RG3 was running the option rookie of the year, offensive rookie of the year in 2014. My former teammate's locker was right next to mine. I was right next to Lennon Fletcher as well. My point is simply this. The next year, all of a sudden, defenses were playing it much better. These coaches get paid a lot of money for a reason. And they don't have a lot of downtime in the offseason, but they got more downtime. And they spend it learning how to get better at what they struggled with the year before. Now the question is, because Tony White's a good coach, the question is, what adjustments is he going to make to their adjustments to what he did? Okay, and it's tougher to do in season, but that's part of being a coach. I'm curious to see, because he's a good coach, I'm curious to see what he can do, what he can come up with, because we've got to make some adjustments. It's not a bad defense. Just not as good as it was last year, and the potential that this defense has, they're not playing up to it yet. They've got the ability to do more. I will say this, I'll never forget Bo Pelini, all right? He was my defensive coordinator my redshirt freshman year before he went elsewhere and came back as the head coach in Nebraska. He said, he told us in a defensive unit meeting, he said, you're never as good as you think you are and you're never as bad as you think you are either. There's always someone out there better. There's always someone out there worse and you can always improve and get better every day. Okay, well, the Huskers, 
Nebraska as a whole, not just the defense, but the team as a whole, probably not as good as we hoped they were, okay, at one point this year, but they're also not as bad as some folks out there think they are now. Now, the question is, will they bounce back? And how do they respond? And what are they gonna do over the course of the season? This is a learning process, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a growing process. I've said since day one, Matt Rule is a good football coach. He is a program builder. He's doing it for a third time here at Nebraska, okay? A program builder. Let me repeat that. Okay, he's a good football coach. I don't know if he's a great football coach simply because he's never stayed anywhere long enough. We don't know, but he is a program builder and I can't wait to see what he does over time here at the University of Nebraska starting with Saturday versus Purdue, then Rutgers at home, and then a bye week and then at Indiana. I'm putting the cart before the horse just a smidge, but here's the deal. I've seen a lot on social media this week where Matt Rule has struggled versus ranked teams. Matt Rule, two and 20 versus ranked teams in his career. He's lost his last 14 in a row versus ranked teams. By the way, Nebraska's lost their last 25 in a row versus ranked teams since 2016. Not enjoyable stats, but they are what they are. This is the same thing I've been saying since day one when we hired Matt Rule. I said, he's a good coach. He's never stayed anywhere long enough. Once he builds a program up, he's always per se gotten a promotion you know, from Temple to Baylor to the Panthers, etc. He's never stayed anywhere long enough in college football for us to find how he can do against ranked teams once he builds a program up. Hence the record that it is right now. There's a learning process here. Matt Rule, okay, this is a guy that's going to learn and grow and get better as a coach. Okay, we will find out whether he's a great coach over time as he learns and develops and grows. And he, he's told me he doesn't plan on coaching anywhere else. He looked me in the eyes and said, Adam, I don't plan on coaching anywhere else. I do believe he'll get Nebraska back to winning a lot of games. And then once the program's built up, then how do you do versus ranked teams? We're gonna find out, all right? It's a learning process. I'll never forget uh, Coach Osborne. It's out there. You know, he lost his first six games to Oklahoma. Finally won his, his first ever game to Oklahoma on the seventh try. There was a point in time where Colorado was trying to take him away because there was a lot of heat here in Nebraska, yet they knew he was a good coach. He stayed because he was telling recruits, hey, this is the place to be. So he felt like if he left, he was lying. Man of integrity. I also remember him telling me a story after the 1990 season. They just kind of got waxed versus co-national champ Georgia Tech in the Citrus Bowl. He gathered all the coaches up and he said, you might want to start looking for jobs. They might let us go. Okay. It was 22 years, ladies and gentlemen, before he won his first national championship. The greatest coach of all time. And I, I say that with all due respect to Nick Saban, the bear, because look at what's happened since he coached here. Nebraska is a phenomenal place, but he did it here. And to me, that makes him the GOAT. So my point is simply this. If the GOAT took a while, let's be in this process together. And I hope that makes sense. All right, now how does Nebraska get back on track? It starts by beating Purdue. Nebraska is a nine and a half point favorite as I sit right here right now over the Boilermakers. Purdue is one and two on the season. All right, and their two losses are by an average of 38 points. I should mention in those two losses, they gave up 362 rushing yards to Notre Dame, 341 rushing yards to Oregon State. They do have running quarterbacks. I should throw that out there. But then we're going to have Rutgers afterwards and Indiana afterwards. I will give my prediction to Purdue here in a minute. Now, Rutgers and Indiana are combined seven and up. They've also played absolutely nobody so far. We do get Rutgers at home and we do get a bye week before we go to Bloomington to take on Indiana. Before I give my prediction to the Illinois game, here's what I wanna do. I wanna talk about a couple of things. Look at the volleyball girls. SMU is not a top team yet. SMU swept the volleyball team a couple of weeks ago. Since then, Nebraska has won multiple matches against highly ranked teams, including sweeping a top five Louisville team, a top five Stanford team, sweeping and dominating them. They've won five matches versus top 15 teams this year, four versus top 10, and two versus top five, the aforementioned sweeps. They bounced back. It was the wake-up call they needed. Look at Michigan. Everyone wrote them off after the Texas game. That game was bad, by the way. They just came out, big time underdogs at home against USC, and they smashed them in the mouth. They out football, out physical USC. It does kind of help the USC only has two linemen that are over 300 pounds on the defensive line on their entire front seven. But if the volleyball girls can bounce back and Michigan can bounce back, here's my point. Four and one doesn't sound so bad. Go out and beat Purdue. Here's my prediction for Purdue. All right, we're averaging 31.5 points per game. They're averaging 25.7. We're giving up 12.8 points per game. They're giving up 34.7. I have Nebraska winning 31 to 17 on the road. Dylan Raiola's first road game. But let's get to four and one. Let's say we beat Rutgers. We're at five and one. All of a sudden, five and one doesn't seem so bad. And I still feel really good about my eight and four record prediction. And I said after the first seven games, I never once said we'd be seven and oh. I said six and one. And you know why I said that? Even though I figured we'd be favored in every single game, the first seven games of the year, because there's going to be a freshman moment. There's going to be a, a bad bounce of a ball. That ball is shaped funny. It bounces all over the place. There's going to be a bad call. 
pause for effect on that one. And I said we'd be six and one. Let's get to four and one, very doable. Then Rutgers at home, then a bye week, then Indiana. It's very doable. Gotta be at least five and two. If we ain't five and two after seven games, we got some issues. But I absolutely believe we can be six and one at worst case, five and two. To come out and predict that we'd be seven and zero oh back in the preseason, I just didn't feel like we'd earn the right. You gotta earn that right to get the benefit of the doubt, even if you're supposed to be favored in all those games. All right, here's my keys to the game and my keys going forward. Number one, play four full quarters. Ladies and gentlemen, we played 16 quarters of football this year. We have nine good quarters. The second half versus Illinois, we, we led in just about every statistical category at halftime. They dominated the stats in the second half, which is why they outgained us, outrushed us, even though we had the advantage in all those categories at halftime. Play four full quarters. Number two, win the battle of the trenches. Illinois' offensive line had not shown much coming into the contest versus Nebraska. Their defensive line had gaping holes in run games versus previous opponents. We lost the battle in the trenches to a team that was not known for being great in the trenches. Win the battle battle of the trenches. Be more physical than Purdue and win the battle of the trenches going forward. Rutgers will be a great test in that. If nothing else, they're physical and they're tough. Greg Schiano's half crazy and he has success in Piscataway. Last but certainly not least, win the freaking special teams. Okay, I know they're not on the field as much as the offense and defense, or they're not talked about as much, but field position is everything. If you start at the 10 versus the 30 on offense, or the opponent starts at their 10 versus the 30, that's huge. It is legit a third of the game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna be joined by our resident local orthopedic expert who joined us last year, and he's, gonna, he's back this year, Scott Strasberger of Syracuse Area Health. But before I bring him on, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors, DPS Concrete Construction. You can check them out at dpsconstruction.net. They are your concrete experts, they are retaining wall experts, and you're in specifically the Omaha metro d area. Hit them up at dpsconstruction.net if this is your line of work. Want a great boss, it's Jason Armstrong. Go to dpsconstruction.net if you want this type of work done, dpsconstruction.net. I also want to give a shout out to Allen Capital Group. All right, they have offices in Ogallala, Omaha, Grand Island. You can check them out at allencapgroup.com. That's A-L-L-E-N-C-A-P group.com. These are the folks who take care of my family's finances they have for over a decade. I'll just be honest with you. I fired my previous financial advisor. He was awful. I didn't trust him. And that was nerve wracking. Once I got to know them and they earned my trust, which they fully have, my mind was at ease and my family's financial future being secure like it is puts my mind at ease. Check them out at allencapgroup.com. Allen Capital Group, next level solutions for next level needs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on Dr. Scott Strasberger. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm joined by renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Scott Strasberger. A little bit more about him. He joined us a couple of times last year. We're happy to have him back again this year. Now, Dr. Strasberger is a former a third team all American two-time first team all-conference performer for the Huskers and was a National Football Foundation and Hall of Fame a Scholar Athlete Award and Postgraduate Scholarship Award winner. Our resident expert, Dr. Scott Strasberger of Syracuse Area Health. How you doing, my friend? Hey, doing well, Adam. Good to see you. Good to be <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's good to see you as well. And so we got a little bit banged up on Friday versus Illinois, unfortunately. Hopefully a lot of these guys can recover and be back sooner than later. And we don't have all the details as we're recording this right now. I'm sure we'll learn more as Rule talks to the press and throughout the week. But initially it was reported that Tommy Hill maybe did something to his head. He was in street clothes at the end of the game. But now Matt Rule has mentioned that it's more of a plantar fascia type issue. <laughs> plantar fascia. Yeah. What, what the heck is that? Why is this such a common problem? And what can be done about it, whether you're an athlete? My, my mom is like 75 and she has issues with her plantar fascia. So if you're an everyday person, an athlete, what is this? Why is it a problem? What can be done? It's a strip of strong tissue that runs along the bottom of our foot. It helps hold our arch in place, serves a couple other minor functions. But as we age, just like everything else in our body, it, it loses it, some of its elasticity. It becomes calcified. And it ages just like the rest of our body. You know, things start to sag, things start to turn gray, things start to change. And you can get tears in it or calcifications. And these little changes in the fascia can, can create pain. And in the younger athletes that we see in high school and college, they'll get little tears in it. And those usually resolve in days or weeks. But if you start getting recurrent microscopic tears, you know, it can become a chronic problem and sometimes can ultimately lead to the need for surgery. There's nobody on the team currently reported with turf toe, but I got to share a story. We yep. had a, a longtime Husker legend, and I'll keep names out of this for the moment, but when I was a player, he came and spoke to us as a team. And we had a particular running back on our team who was missing time because of a turf toe. 
though. And I'll never forget, he's talking to the team, and out of nowhere, he goes, and what the heck is turf toe? What is that? Back in my day, we would have played through everything. And I remember looking at the running back because he was in the front row, and you could just see him kind of getting a little beat red because everyone knew what he was talking about. So I'm just kind of curious because I've never forgotten that, and I've never asked you about it. What exactly is turf toe? And it has to be way more serious than it sounds because I know guys you've had it, and it's very, very painful. Yes, and and we all know who you're referring to in the conversation. <laughs> um, a, a turf toe is the, the lining of the big toe joint. Uh, there are ligaments and capsules that help hold the toe in place and help it function as it needs to function. And with hyperflexion or hyperextension injuries to the toe, you can get tearing of this capsule and some of those ligaments, and those become extremely painful. And the problem is, especially for a running back who runs on this, every time he plants his foot and turns on this, he can keep re-injuring it. So these injuries take forever to get better. And oftentimes at the end of the season, or if it gets to the point where people just can't continue to play, it can require some surgery. All right, so we've got, unfortunately, a couple of offensive linemen that are banged up. And Teddy Prochaska has been out for a while. Everyone knew that, but he's had multiple knee issues, uh, torn ACL, multiple ACL issues. But now Turner Corcoran is banged up, okay, and he he didn't finish the game after the first drive and he was seen limping off the field and Matt Rule said it pretty much seems serious at this point in time. Talk to me about these guys that are like six foot eight, six nine, 330 pounds. How can they stay healthy throughout the season? Obviously, they try to get strong in the offseason, but stay healthy throughout the season with the pounding that the big bodies take every single play in the trenches. Yeah, you know, that's just a great point, Adam. You know, these, these guys are getting so strong and so large and they're creating so much force that sometimes they just create so much energy during a play that the energy exceeds the strength of the ligaments and the tissues that are protecting that joint, especially the knee. Uh, oftentimes, ACL injuries are what we call non-contact injuries. It's not the fact that someone hit them. It's the fact that they planted their foot with such great force that the force and the energy generated exceeded the ability of the ligaments to hold the knee in place. And once those limits are exceeded, you'll see rupture or tears in the tissue or the ligaments. Okay. Again, and we're going to learn more about these injuries as the week goes along. But some of these guys have joined an injury list that already include guys who've been there for a while. Like I mentioned, Prohaska and Javin Wright and Bly Hills trying to work his way back, the cornerback as well. We're getting that to that point in the season. We're a third of the way in. We're inching towards the midpoint. Guys get beat up. The injury rate in football, if you play long enough, is 100%. What can guys do to try to maintain their strength throughout the season, but try to do things like prehab, a term some people hate, but try to prevent injuries and stay healthy? healthy as the season wears along. Well, going back to some of the players that you mentioned earlier, some of them genetically are just predisposed to that. But as you stated, 100% of them are exposed to these significant forces and, and contact injuries that they're all going to have issues at some point during the season. You know, you treat those issues as quickly and as thoroughly as you can, and you get back to the point where you can strengthen and condition uh, as you need to during the season to maintain your abilities to continue you playing. Strengthening and conditioning is the primary thing you can do during the season to, to minimize the effect of those injuries. But sometimes those injuries accumulate to the point where you can't do some of this. So it is a, you know, it's a balancing act uh, to keep these players on the field for an entire season. So there's one Colorado player that I actually like. All right. And that's Travis Hunter. Okay. What he's doing is amazing to me playing on both sides of the ball. He's averaging over 130 plays a game. Okay. And he just wants to do things the right way. How can a guy average over 130 plays a game and to my knowledge and I'll knock on wood on his behalf okay stay so healthy uh, talk to me about a guy like Travis Hunter who just seems to be a unicorn and an anomaly why can he do some of the things he can do yet other people just for whatever reason whether it's genetics or not have a hard time just staying on the field well you and you just hit the nail on the head. He's a genetic freak. You know, he has potential that m most of us will never have. He also is diligent in his prehab and his rehab following. He does hyperbaric oxygen. He does cold therapy after every practice, after every game. He is dedicated to his profession 110%. So he is working harder uh, than the rest of us, but he's also doing things before and after his workouts that most athletes and players aren't, aren't considering, like hyperbaric 
hyperbaric oxygen, cold therapy, things of that nature. Here's a question I've always wanted to ask. And the simple answer is they're just used to being hit more. But here's the question I have. Running quarterbacks seem to get hurt less to me than pocket quarterbacks. And maybe it's just because they're used to getting hit more often. But if a pocket quarterback takes off and run and gets hit hard, everyone's like, oh my God. But if an option quarterback does it, nobody bats an eye. Why? Why? Is it just that they're used to getting hit more? Am I, am I missing something here? Expectations are different. Yes. Adam. Okay. Um, is that it? That is probably the mainstay there. Um, there are other factors. You know, these athletes are maybe made a little bit different, but I, I think you're absolutely correct. These guys are used to getting hit. They're used to having some mild bumps and bruises and they, they can deal with it during the game. They don't need to come out and be seen being evaluated in the medical tent after those things happen. All right. I'm going to ask you a question on, I got six kids. They all play multiple sports. I coached my son, Jacob from fourth grade football, all the way to eighth grade football. So I'm going to ask you the question I've been asked a million times when it comes to head injuries and the safety of young kids playing football. Is there an appropriate age that you, you think exists for them to start playing football? Does it just completely vary from kid to kid? What are your thoughts on the head concerns of parents and kids playing tackle football at certain ages? Well, well, we obviously are addressing the head injuries much more aggressively than we used to, Adam. And that's the most important thing. We're making changes in blocking and tackling that that will decrease or diminish the degree of the head injuries significantly. You know, with little league kids, uh, one of the biggest factors in in head injuries is speed and size, and we just mm -hmm. don't see that in the little league that we have to be as as concerned about. They're not falling as far, they're not getting hit as hard, but they still can get head injuries. You can see that in in and little league basketball, little league soccer, you know, that's why heading the ball in little league soccer is, is treated differently than it is as, as the soccer players advance in age. So we're doing a lot of things in a lot of sports to try to diminish the exposure to head injuries, but they still will happen. And when they happen, they need to be diagnosed accurately and treated accurately. And, and a lot of the protocols really used to be a lot of middle room for, for interpretation. Now it's pretty black and white who can go back and play and who can't following a head injury here's what i tell parents because it's going to cross over a lot with what you just said my wife coaches club soccer and it is actually illegal to head the ball until a certain age it's a penalty correct, in the game correct. and that was one of my wife's big concerns was teaching heading properly she actually brought in someone else to help and now she's more comfortable with it my experience in football i'll just be blunt i've seen more head injuries than flag football because kids run into each other but there's no helmets correct okay and like you said it's smaller bodies they're not going as fast and tackle they got these pads half the time they fall over just because they've got the pads on they aren't used to the the weight of the pad. And so for me, I started Jacob in fourth grade because I didn't feel flag was any safer. And he's a big kid. Flag football is not made for big kids. So that was part of it too. Plus he was begging me since the second grade to start his tackle football. Is, is there a last question I got for you? And it might vary from kid to kid, but is there a particular age like, hey, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, my dad didn't let me start till seventh grade playing tackle football, that you'd recommend parents let their kids uh, start playing tackle football? Well, you know, every kid develops neurologically a little bit different. So I don't think there's an absolute absolute answer for that. A lot of that is developmental, but the, I think the important thing, Adam, is we're recognizing that these injuries occur a lot more often than we've thought. Uh, we recognize the injury and we're treating it much more appropriately now. So recurrent injuries are far less than what they used to be. You know, it used to be someone came over on the sideline, got some smelling salts and went right back in. We don't see yep. that happen. We don't see that happen. Yes. You know, there's, there's great advancement in diagnosing and treatment now. So I think that's the most important thing out there. Um, we don't let the high energy head injuries occur in new sports like they used to occur. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Dr. Scott Strasberger of Syracuse Area Health for joining me. As always, you can check out characterchronicles.com for us. All your Husker sports hopes and dreams will come true there. It's just science. And I got some questions for you fine folks at home. Let me know your answers in the comments below. Number one, do you feel good if we have a bunch of second stringers or backups who have to play versus Purdue? Do you feel good about them stepping in and playing well? Number two, are you happy with Nebraska's strength conditioning program and training staff to this point? I can tell you I feel like it's an upgrade over the previous years personally. And number three, do you believe Nebraska, simply yes or no, would be more physical than Purdue on Saturday? And all right, doctor, you can be the first doctor to ever say throw the bones on the show if you want so until next time husker nation go big red and always remember throw the bones <laughs>